I don't know. I don't know. How long can you know that there's something bigger for you and yet you ignore that? Don't we do that? Don't we do that? And we tell ourselves what? I'm going to take on a bigger picture in my life. I really will reassess my career, relationship, health. When? Later. <laughs> right? We always do this. I am. I just can't because I'm busy right now. And we get so wrapped up in the moment, we make this promise to ourselves of later. I pushed away school till later. I pushed away taking, stepping into my life in the biggest sense. I pushed that away to later. And when you push that away, you'll push away even the most important things. You know, because I used to visit my mother in the hospital for five hours. Like, I would sit with her all day. I used to, I, you know, with, I was the person who visited her most, so I felt responsible for bringing her the strawberry milkshake from the cafeteria or, you know, the oldies. She liked the oldies, so we used to listen to the radio and we'd sing the songs together. And I'd help her wash her hair while we played the radio and clumps of my mother's hair would come out in my hands. Anybody ever lose somebody to disease? You know what I mean by this? There's good days and bad days. And then the bad days become more frequent. And when that became too painful, and you believe me, it did, I said, Ma, you know what? I love you. I gotta go. I'm gonna hang out with my friends. I'll be back later. And I treated her like later, like I'll get to that later too. I pushed her away so much, and I'll never forget the last time I saw her was on Thanksgiving Day. She wouldn't eat, you know the hospital gives you the celebratory meal, she, she wouldn't eat it because she had sores in her mouth. And when that was too much, I just said, Ma, you know what, I love you. I'll be back later. I did not come back. She passed away about a month later, and we buried her the day after Christmas. We didn't have money for a real funeral, so they donated this pine box with serial numbers on it, and they had the words head and feet, and they drew an arrow on her pine box. I don't know. Have you ever had an experience that has impacted you so deeply it's changed the person that you are? You look to tell people about it, but sometimes words don't do it. When I lost her, and I connected to this experience of thinking, you know, because I was sure I had a later, and yet here was the pine box, and there was no later. I saw this opportunity and I just realized, you know what, there's something in this for me to realize and learn from. It didn't come to me at first. At first I just wanted to cry and you believe me I did. And I miss her to this day. Like I'm talking to you guys about her now and I'm remembering a dream I had about her last night. Like I keep her here. But she also gave me a gift. And that gift is the reason that I'm here with you today. Because I swore I had a later. And I pushed that out so much. Have you ever heard a saying, what a man can be, he must be? See, before she passed away, I thought I had all the time in the world. But then I went back to my neighborhood. I hung out with my friends. I thought life could be the same. But when she wasn't there anymore, this amazing thing happened to me and transformed the person I am. I no longer had tolerance for the stagnation in my life. And I hung out with my friends who I love, but they were sitting there and their whole conversation had 10 or 11 street kid friends. We all had like punk rock kids hanging out together. And do you know what they were doing when I got back from burying my mother? They were in a conversation of complaining. I, I came back, I had buried my mom and I'm hearing my friend Bobby complain about his mom. His, my other friend complains about school, this person's complaining, you know, they were complaining and I sat down and I realized that the conversation I had created in my life as much as I knew I had to survive, the conversation in my life was one of complaining. It's like, do you have a friend that you call? And every time you call them, they're always having a bad day. You call them, how are you today? Oh, hanging in there, you know, or maybe you're the friend and you sound like that. <laughs> you want to check in with yourself. Because I sat on my friend's couches and I realized they were complaining and complaining and complaining. And I sat down and I said to myself, you know what? And I just stood up and looked at my friends and said, guess what, guys? I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight. I, at one of your houses, maybe, maybe outside. I don't know what I'm going to eat. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. But you know what I do have? Two hands and two feet. I have a brain in my head, air in my lungs. And what else do I really need? Like, what else do you really need to begin today to lead the life you know you are meant to lead? You know in your heart what it is. You know. And what more needs to change before you step into that? I stood up and I looked at them and the next feeling, which has been the biggest resource in my life since, gratitude. You can either pick one thing in life, resentment or gratitude. Get on a side, I promise you. I looked at that moment and realized that I may not have my mother ever again, 
But I had these resources, I had myself, and I could go forward. I knocked on every door of every school that would interview me. I was the same age as a college freshman trying to enter high school. I was dressed in gothic clothes, I smelled. I mean, would you have taken me if I knocked on your door? Uh-uh. I mean, my transcripts were a train wreck. I knocked on every door I could. I was told no so many times, but I learned a valuable lesson at that time. As long as you keep knocking, somebody will eventually say yes. I got accepted to a school, I enrolled, I committed to straight A's. I remember that the feeling inside of me and needing to change my life and that voice in the back of my head, it, it took on a specific question. And the question was, what if? You know that voice in the back of your head that says, what if? What if I tried that much harder? What if I pushed one more time? What if? It's the part of you that dreams. My what if was, well, what if I committed to go to school, got the best grades, could I change my life? Is that possible? And I became so obsessed with that question, I enrolled in morning class, regular class, after school class, night school, independent study, Saturday class. I became a nerd, and I had really never been to school. And I did absolutely anything it took, enrolled in one full year per semester, and I was sleeping on the street. I would come in every single day and I used all the energy in my body to produce and get things done because that vision that I had for myself, this bigger life that I would step into, that became my commitment instead of my excuses. I stepped into that and I worked very hard. I quickly gained a 96 average. I became the top student in the school and I hid from the teachers that I was homeless. Nobody knew that most nights when everybody else went home, I would just go ahead and lay myself down on a, I'd go to this hallway around the corner from my school, I'd do my homework by the hallway light, I'd come back in in the morning, and that would be it, wash my face in the sink. I mean, there are many things I did to survive, and there may be time after for questions. People always want to know, did you eat from the garbage? Did you, I mean, they ask all these homeless questions, I'm totally fine with answering them, but I want to share with you what transforms a life, and it would not be in where I got my food. Let me leave the main point to this. This is where it really the breakthrough was. And if ever there's something that in your life that you want that hasn't turned out and you kind of can't identify why, I promise you, you can hear it in this. This is what holds us back. Sometimes I would sleep in friends' homes and there'd be 15 people sleeping across a floor in a flop house. I had an hour subway ride to get to my school in Manhattan and I would step around my friends when the sun was coming up and I remember getting to the door early in the morning and my friends were all passed out and I would put my hand on the doorknob er, ready for the day, early class, regular class, after school class, all that ahead of me and I would be tempted at that moment touching that doorknob to go back to sleep. <laughs> and I would be hit with that feeling. And do you know that feeling when the alarm clock goes off and you go, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> no, and not today, right? Or, you know, maybe you're in the buffet line and it's vegetables or bacon, or you know, you're at a moment and you're just saying to yourself, there's the empowering choice or there's a disempowered choice. There's the empowering choice or the disempowered choice. And you got to pick one. Here's what holds us back from having what we want to have. I stood at that doorknob and faced with the choice of the empowerment or the disempowerment, that's the moment I wanted to feel sorry for myself. Isn't it interesting how all the other times of the day when I was doing just fine, I didn't want to think about the sad stuff, <laughs> but just at the moment I had to come through with my commitment. See, when you're faced with the choice and it gets a little tough, you want to let yourself off the hook by reminding yourself how hard your life is. And I had a good one. Okay, I would stand there and think, oh, life's tough, you know, or look what happened to me when I was five. Or, you know, I would really summon all the tragedy and try to give myself an excuse to be in the disempowered conversation and give up. And I knew that I really could make this choice, but I so wanted to give up. And I could have woken up one of my friends. Hey, guys, life sucks. I shouldn't do anything, right? They go, yeah, life sucks. You know, and they would agree with me. You want to be careful where you get your agreement in life. I had lots of agreement around that. And it's true. Don't you have that friend that says, sure, you're off the hook. We totally understand. I had that in my life. But here's the difference. A disempowered conversation will do a couple of things. It will look for blame, and it's concerned with the past. It'll go, what happened before? Why didn't it work out? It'll count what's not there. That's what a disempowered conversation will do, and it searches for blame. An empowered conversation is unconcerned with blame. It simply says, what's next? And it steps forward with a willingness to be responsible for what happens next. That's the difference between empowered and disempowered conversation. And I stood at that doorway and I knew nothing in my history took away from the fact that I still had a choice. What transforms a life? 
one empowered choice after the next over time. I stood there and I knew that nothing would take away from the fact that I am at every moment a choice. And I stepped to that empowered choice and time went on and I crunched four years of school into two. I maintained my average was an A average. Uh, no one knew I was homeless at the school. And finally at the end, <laughs> At the end, the teacher that I was so close with, his name was Perry, he took the top 10 students on a trip to Boston, and we went sightseeing, like from New York, and we went to Harvard Yard simply for a group picture in front of the statue for the yearbook. And as I stood in Harvard Yard, I, I don't know, I don't have the words. I mean, it felt like it's a beautiful moment in life when you thought something was above and beyond you, and you realize that really, there's no difference between you and someone else. All you need to do is the work. And I stood there and realized I was qualified. I dropped that application. I found out that college was $40,000 a year. I could not afford a turkey sandwich, so this was going to be a pinch. <laughs> and and I, I looked for scholarships, and I happened upon this one scholarship from the New York Times. Somebody told me this is called a Godwink. Maybe you give me another name for it later. The criteria, $12,000 a year every year for school from the New York Times. Please attach a brief autobiographical essay outlining any obstacles you've overcome in your life. <laughs> Well, needless to say, I put it in the mail. I, I actually thought, well, if they don't give it to me, I'd like to meet the person, because, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I just, well, went from 3,000 applicants to 21 finalists, and one day I walked into welfare to apply for food stamps. The next day, uh, the next hour in that very same day, I walked into a Harvard interview in Midtown Manhattan, and then later on I went to the New York Times interview, so it went welfare, Harvard, New York Times, I remember thinking, I'm going to be, you know, and welfare was the only thing that did not go well that day, so someone tell me what's up with the system, but I went in and they told, and the woman was being difficult with me, and I said, I have an interview with Harvard after this, she said, all right, princess, we got Stanford and Yale coming in, you go take us, really? All right, I left. I went to the Harvard interview, it went well. I went to the New York Times, did not realize how prestigious the New York Times was. And listen, in my neighborhood, no one read, I didn't know. I walked in, and you know, everyone's hyperventilating and freaking out, they knew. And I come in and they offered me, hey, are you hungry? There's a tray of pastries for me. No one would touch it because they're hyperventilating. And I look, I'm, yeah, I am hungry. And they, I said, could I take two donuts? They said, the whole tray is up for grabs. I shoved the whole tray right in my bag, walked myself to the New York Times interview. They had a box of tissues for me to cry. I didn't realize. And I, oh, good, I thought. And I start wrapping up my donuts as the interview began. <laughs> But you know what the lesson is in that? Sometimes when you don't know what it is that you're not supposed to be able to do, you will go right ahead and do it. And I did. Six of us won the scholarship. Thousands of applicants, six of us won the scholarship. And on the cover of the Metro section, next to an article, they had Bill and Hillary Clinton. And <laughs> then they had the six of us right in this article. It said, Liz Murray will graduate having squeezed all four years into two with an A average while homeless, so my secret was out. I talked about my mother passing and my father being diagnosed and all these other things that had gone on. And at the end, I guess the reporter couldn't help himself. He said, Liz was in welfare the morning she came to see us, and they quoted the woman. <laughs> you got Yale, or whatever it was. And I, I hope you read this, I thought, and I held it in my hand. <laughs> Everything has changed. Life is beautiful. I'm sorry, I just am filled with this feeling of gratitude as I'm standing here with you today. Life is a miracle. <laughs> you don't have to be stuck in the situations that you're in. If there's something in your life that is holding you back, you have to identify what that is because I promise you there is a way to break past it. I, on June 4th this year, I will graduate from Harvard with a degree in psychology. <laughs> I am so very blessed and so very grateful and the lessons that I take with me as I coach and I lead workshops and my dream now is to open pathways for other people. I like to be with people, listen closely for what's in the way, identify it and knock it out so that we can step into what matters most to us. I want each of us, as we finish now, to get really clear on what it is. There is some vision you have for your life. Where are you in your vision and your career? Where are you in your relationship? There's something you have going on in your heart and you know, you know in your heart that you're so close to stepping into it. I want you to identify that voice inside of yourself and begin to trust it. Ask yourself, what is it that's been in my way and how do I unblock that? Dig deep inside because you know of all things that my mother taught me and my later this and later that, life does not wait for anyone. 
Life does not wait for anyone, and your life isn't later. Your life is right now. I'd like to continue this conversation with you of empowerment. I would love to hear from all of you at my website, homelesstoharvard.com. I would love to reach out to all of you in any way I can. And as we, as we leave here, just connect with that vision for yourself. Ask yourself what if. Identify what's in the way and realize that life doesn't wait for anyone. Your life is right now. Thank you so much for having me here today, guys. I'm so blessed. Thank you so much.